Okay, let's see again. Oh yeah, there you go. So let me start with the acknowledgement that we are UBC and Triumph, where I work. Uh, is, uh, they are both situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Muscan people. And we are actually really privileged to be able to learn together on this land and in this space. No, I think I just have to stand here, Kate. <laughs> there we go. So a few words about myself. Uh, I actually, I'm coming from Europe. I started my studies in Poland, and after that I moved to Denmark. From Denmark I moved to Germany, from Germany to Switzerland, and I actually finished here in Canada. This might look like I'm a bit undecided, but I would like to see it as being on a mission to figure out what I actually want to do in my life. And I'm usually interested in so many things at once that's actually hard for me to, to just settle in one field. So I migrated a little bit from physics, starting in physics, then moving to biophysics, then actually ending up in bioorganic chemistry, which came as a blessing for what I'm doing right now. So especially to young of you who are still undecided what you want to do in your life, feel free to change your fields. Feel free to see what flies better with you, what is more interesting, and so on. You can do it without uh, losing much to that. All right, so let me start with asking you a question. How many of you actually are familiar with the immortal words of Carl Sagan that we are made of star stuff? Don't be shy. Good, I'm really happy to, to see that. But have you actually ever wondered what that really means? What does it mean? Go ahead. Oh, okay, I'll try it. Go, go for it. Very good, I can actually go. Here, get to take over. No, very good. It's actually literally what it is. Uh, talking about we are made of star stuff, what actually is star stuff? And like you properly mentioned, it's a, I will just in here, or no? There we go. So star stuff, it's basically a form of a cosmic dust which is made of particles that you can find in the universe. And those particles have been created in many different ways. Some of them were created directly in the Big Bang, like hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium as well. Some of them were created with collisions with uh, highly charged uh, cosmic ray. But the majority of them, like you very rightfully said so, have been created in stars. So when the stars are being formed, they are reaching really high temperatures and pressures inside of them. They create elements. When they die, they shoot all of the elements outside of the universe. So this is what the star stuff is made of. How do we, as humans, fit into that? I think I'll just end here. Like that. So periodic table of elements shows you 118 different chemical elements that we know of today. On Earth, we have about 92 of them. In the human body, we can detect 60 but only these 26 are essential to us. And what I mean by essential is that we know from the experimental evidence that those elements are absolutely crucial to fulfill life-sustaining functions. And let me give you a few examples of that. We are carbon-based uh, carbon creatures. We have calcium in our bones. We have iron in our blood, so iron is actually the not only responsible for transporting oxygen all over our body, but also gives our blood the color, red. Do you know what is the, the blood color of octopus? Blue. blue, why is it blue? Very good. And copper gives it a blue color. Some of my favorite elements are actually magnesium and calcium. Magnesium, that is a very nice one. How many of you are running? or jogging, or doing different kind of experiments. Are you familiar with muscle cramps? What do you do when you have muscle cramps? Stretch. Stretch. What else, if stretching doesn't help? Yes, if that doesn't help, what else? Salt. Salt. Someone said magnesium. Why magnesium? You know what? There is there is no right answer. We still don't quite understand why magnesium is allowing our muscles to relax. And fin finally so, we need magnesium to relax the muscles, <coughs> but we need calcium to contract them. So nature chose to work with two different elements from the periodic table to do movements like that. Right? 
I could spend like really hours here on this slide because I'm like fascinated, for example, with lithium. Our body doesn't need lithium at all. It's one, the only actually element that was created directly in the Big Bang, which is not required by our body physiologically, but it's required by our, our mind. So people who suffer from um, bipolar disorder, they are g being given drugs which are based on lithium. And how do doctors determine how much or how big of a dose give to those patients? Gas. We still don't know why lithium helps us to calm down. We still don't know what is the proper level of lithium we need in our body to keep it at the steady pace. So there's a bit of a miss and, and, and hit uh, game at that stage. Anyhow, so now that we know what we have in our body, Let's have a look how much of it we have in our body. Four elements. So remember the number 26. It's going to be very important to that story. Four elements out of the 26 you can find in your body are oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And those are also the elements that are the most abundant in the solar system. So as I told you, they are the most abundant. They are absolutely crucial to our body. So let's put your biology and chemistry knowledge to test. The two molecules that you can see here. Clearly, they are made only of those four elements. They look quite similar to, to each other, right? They only differ with this side group over here. Any idea? Don't be shy. I'm not judgmental. No. This will come later on. No. It's crucial. I'm really emphasizing the word crucial. No. Anyone? Nobody? Ta da! <laughs> Chocolate and coffee. Now you have it. Black and white proof. They are absolutely essential for our body. More so. There is an research evidence that there is a clear correlation, and I'm not joking, this has been published in the research journal, that there is a clear correlation between how much chocolate you eat in a country as a number of Nobel Prize winners. Okay. There you have it. Switzerland is in the clear run. Canada has to pick up a bit more with chocolate eating. I showed that graph to my son. And the moment I did so, I regret it. You know why? Because now whenever I find him eating chocolate, he tells me, Mom, I'm doing that for research. <laughs> All righty, going back to the elements. So we tackled four of them. We know what to eat, what not to eat. The additional seven elements you have listed over here. So those are calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, and so on. Those 11 elements are present in every single living form on Earth. Those elements are building blocks of all plants, animals, viruses, bacteria, as you name them. They also form the composition of the seawater. And if you add the two numbers over here, this is by weight, you can immediately see that we are almost at 100%, right? But what did they tell you? How many elements do we have? 26, right? We have 11 here. How many of them we are missing? 15. And those 15 elements, exist in the human body in a traceless <coughs> amount. And what that means, they exist in a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. And nevertheless, they are extremely important to our well-being. And let me give you one example. Augusta Dieter. In 1901, she was admitted to the hospital, uh, psych psychiatric ward actually, in a hospital in Frankfurt. She was delusional, she was screaming that people want to kill her, she couldn't remember the basic details of her life. Nothing. The doctor that took care of her at that time, he did not know how to help her. So what he did, for the five later years, until she passed away, he only cared for her. He was there for her. Nothing more. And now the peculiar part of the story, except for the old pictures, is that if Augusta was admitted to the hospital today, we, we wouldn't be able to give her anything else than doctor did, Dr. Alois did, more than 100 years ago. Do you recognize the name? 
and Augusta was the very first patient diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Since 1901, we have made a great progress in medicine. We have discovered antibiotics, we have so many different vaccinations, we even know how to treat certain types of cancer. But we had made no progress at all in treating Alzheimer patients. Actually, out of top 10 causes of death around the world today, Alzheimer's disease is the only one that we cannot predict, we cannot prevent, we cannot cure, and what's even worse, we cannot slow down. So what we do right now, we are just keeping patients comfortable and giving them uh, medicine to allow them to function normally in, in their life. There's, we don't know the origins of Alzheimer. That's the biggest problem. But what we do know is that pretty much every single patient diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease has a bit peculiar distribution of copper in their brain. So for every single of the elements that I showed you, we have a given concentration, means number or weight in the body. For patients with Alzheimer, the overall concentration of copper remains the same. But what is happening in their brain is that copper is being drained from parts of the brain into the nodes, which are illustrated here with the red color. So the concentration distribution, in a way, of copper in the brain is altered. We don't know why this is happening. We don't know if this is the cause or the result, nothing. But we do know it is related to copper. And actually, recent clinical trials where patients are being given copper-based drug can restore that imbalance to a certain extent. Copper is not easy to work with, and neither are those four elements, three of them being absolutely essential to us, and one, which I will touch on a little, a little bit later, <coughs> is becoming the go-to metal for cancer treatment. Reason for all of that, they are silent. What it means from the research point of view that a metal is silent. We have no tools to study them directly. They have no magnetic or electronic properties that we could actually study. You can put them as much as, as you want into a beaker where you do your experiment. You won't see them silent. So what do we do currently? We are actually searching for other uh, chemical elements that have very similar chemical properties. Like, for example, for copper, we are using silver. So we are removing copper from the natural protein. We replace it with silver. And we are hoping that we'll get information that is similar enough. Is that working? Not really. So what we have learned over a couple of decades of doing so is that if you do such replacement, the overall structure will remain correct. So the protein, the peptide, they will fold in the correct way, having even the wrong metal in it. But they are inactive. They won't do their job the way we want them to. So we get sort of like a half of the information only. So what do we have to do? Like a wise man once said, we have to unlearn pretty much what we have learned and start doing things in a bit different way. What does it mean for us chemists? Well, we have to forget about chemistry tools as we know of them today, and we have to see what our neighbors, like Matthias, uh, what they are using. And why do we do that? It's because we are after the same elements they want to study. Astrophysicists want to study why certain elements were created in a certain way in stars. So they need tools to study them. So why don't we do the same? Why don't we use the same tools as they do? Well, problem is that human body is not exactly an element, so there is a lot of technicality uh, to be overcome, but it's doable. So what do we do? And what we have done is forget about the periodic table of elements. Let's move to this. How many of you are familiar with nuclear chart? Very good. So basically, you still have the periodic table of elements, like Mendeleev show us here. Indicated in black are all of the stable elements that you can find in the periodic table of elements. But what you have on the left and right are the isotopes of the element. So now different chemical elements have different number of protons. Every single chemical element, though, can have different number of neutrons. And those we call isotopes, and they are usually not stable. And this is what we want, because this will open up a whole new revenue for us to study. So we are, again, let me point out, we are after the same elements as are being studied to understand the beginning of the universe or how certain nuclei look the way they do. But there's a problem. 
it touches on the word radioactive or nuclear, and nuclear doesn't exactly get a good press, right? So let me show you just very briefly one element because it's going to be easier for us to move on later on. Copper, because that's one of my favorite ones. You have 30 different isotopes of copper, two of them being stable, 28 being non-stable, radioactive. And majority of them will actually decay in a process called beta decay. They are three major types of how radioactive processes are happening. It's alpha decay, when the nucleus is ejecting alpha particle. There's beta decay, which is by far, by far my favorite one. And then there's a gamma decay. Working with radioactivity and nuclear tools gives us power and gives us sensitivity to study what we want to do. Because in principle, right now, we see all of the elements. In copper, we are no longer after copper 63. We can choose any other copper. From the body point of view, a, a chemical element is a chemical element. Doesn't matter which one here. It's still copper. So we don't have to just stick to that one poor fellow who cannot help us. We can choose anything. Then, as Matthias also showed you before, effective detection. Radioactivity is so incredibly beautiful because you can see every single particle. One decay, one particle, you will see it. This is impossible with stable isotopes. Sensitivity, because we can detect every single small particle, we are suddenly opening up a possibility to do experiments in the body-like environment. All the way up until now, when we work with NMR or any other chemistry uh, type of spectroscopy, you have to overload your system. So instead of uh, working, I don't know, <coughs> potassium, because uh, Matthias actually used that example, we have about 140 grams of potassium in our body. But if we want to study just one protein, we just need one. We don't need 140 grams. To be able to do experiment with potassium in conventional NMR, we will have like at least factor of five more potassium available in the surrounding of that one protein. It doesn't give us the right information. I mean, it's like put a kid in the store with chocolate. They won't finish with one. They will keep on going. And that's what the protein will do as well. Nuclear again. You all are familiar with some of the nuclear tools. PET, positron emission tomography, MRI in a hospital. Those are all nuclear research tools which are actually being used and they serve humans, right? MRI used to have nuclear at the very beginning. So it was nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. The nuclear was dropped because, again, it's, it's not a very popular word, unfortunately. We will reestablish that. We will show everyone nuclear and radioactivity can be good. We have phenomenal control over it. They, they bring so many different ways of investigating and targeting the questions that we want to. And this is what I will show you here, how we do it. So let's switch to magnesium right now because uh, magnesium is also very neat to work with. I'm choosing magnesium 31. So no longer the stable magnesium 25 or 24, or 26. I'm choosing 31 because it has the right properties I'm interested in. Why beta decay is my favorite? It's because it's extremely easy to trace. And what I mean by that is if we have a single radioisotope of magnesium, single, just one. And we know how it is oriented in the space, and we can do it by applying tiny, tiny magnetic field of the order of the Earth magnetic field. Then the beta decay, so the electron or positron, will be emitted either in the direction or opposite to it, nowhere else. I know that. So now I can actually use that information to choose where to put the detectors. And I'll put them like that. I will put them in the most likely and the least likely direction the beta particle will be emitted. And that's what we do in our experiment. That's the only measurement we take. We have two detectors, one at zero, one at 180 degrees. You can put them left and right, doesn't matter. It's really arbitrary here. And then we measure the difference between the particles. We count particles detected in both of those detectors. That is the only experimental value we are measuring. So how do we get from that one value to actually running an MRI? Because what I'm telling you here today, it has a fancy name. It's called beta NMR. But what it really is, it's MRI. MRI gives you an image of the whole body. 
but I'm only interested in a given protein because, for example, I want to know why a plug in the human brain is being formed that way or not other. So I'm not interested in how the other parts of the body are behaving. I'm just interested in that one protein, right? So what we do is we just start with that one nuclei. Obviously, we are working with more to have a bit more statistics. And we start with a given situation where we will naturally have difference between these two detectors. And for magnesium, that difference is about 30%. Now, like it is being done in MRI, we will shoot perpendicular radio frequency wave. And at some point, what will happen, we will lose that asymmetry. So at some point, we'll hit that sweet point where we'll have exact number of particles here and here. And this is what we call the Larmor frequency. And this is also the very same property that is being recorded in MRI. So that we use to determine how the structure of our protein work, uh, looks like. But we can also measure other things. We can measure, like for example, in PET you can image how blood flows through the body. We can do that time-sensitive measurements using that technology. And what we do, we don't apply any perpendicular field anymore. We are just implanting our isotope and we let it decay. And by fitting that curve over here, so you know, when it decays, it gives you this shape of a curve. And by fitting it, we can get the information, how fast things are happening and so on. So where do we do it? We do it at Triumph. Are you familiar with Triumph? Have you ever been to Triumph? Okay, I'm really happy to see that. And I'm really looking forward for Triumph to reopen for public tours soon. So basically, we are, my sense of orientation sucks big time, but I believe we're somewhere over here at the moment. Triumph is located here. So we are in that direction. You can walk. I walked this morning. It's about 25 minutes walk. Triumph is Canada's particle accelerator center. It was founded in 1968, still, right? That's correct. And since then, it, uh, it has delivered nearly six decades of very good science. At the heart of Triumph is the world's largest cyclotron. It's about 18 meters in diameter, and we actually do own a Guinness record for that. This is how our campus looks like. So we have several different buildings. The great heart is over here in the cyclotron. You can come and see it once Triumph opens. You can actually go on top of it, because it's obviously shielded with concrete. But when you go on top of it, you can still feel the, the magnetic field from it. You can align paper clips, and they will stay in that very arrangement. So anyhow, we are not using the protons accelerated by the cyclotron directly. But what we do, and what Matthias hinged on a little bit, is we are actually accelerating the protons to 520 mega electron volts, and we shoot them onto a target. And now it's when you shoot something so incredibly energetic on some other target, what will happen, you will produce a ton of other things. You produce a whole cocktail of different chemical elements and isotopes of those uh, elements. And from that, we have to choose the one we are interested in. So if I want to study magnesium, I would ask the operators, please deliver magnesium 31 to me. If I study copper, I will ask them, please deliver copper 74 to me. And that's what they do. So here you can actually see the, the setup itself and the two of my students mounting the sample net. Our magnets are much, much smaller than MRI magnets. And we are actually trying to compact them even more. Why we want to do that? It's because we want to have our system to be fully mobile. We want our system to be able to roll next to the bed of the patient or even send them to the remote location so that everyone has equal access uh, to, to medical tools. And here you can see Arisha mounting one of our samples. This is the sample holder, how we use it, highly sophisticated, as you can see. A dimple here, which is three millimeters in diameter. This is how much we need. Those are the tiny volumes we need to, to do our experiments. ATP, someone dropped a question, ATP. You are familiar with ATP, right? It's, a, it's basically the currency of energy in our body. And this is how it looks like. It's tiny, so it has adenosine base over here, sugar, and three phosphate, uh, phosphorus groups here. So now, this is ATP as it exists in its fully charged form. So I love to think about ATP as a battery. When it is fully charged, it looks like that. But then when you need energy to run, to, to eat, even to sleep, what will happen? That very last part of the chain will be cleavaged. 
So now we depleted our battery. We have to charge it somehow. Luckily for us, the body does it for us. We don't have to do it. It's automatic. So I already prompted that ATP is the unit of energy in our body. We need it for very basic uh, functions, right? But our guys in Qatar will really need it because <laughs> they have to face Belgium, which is second, ranked second, right? And Croatia, which lost only to France during the last World Cup. And we will need energy to cheer for them, right? Because they are so far away and also like, because their task is not really easy. Oh, yeah. Go Canada. Alrighty, ATP in its natural form looks like that. And this is when it's not active. It will be floating around in our body, but it will not give you energy. In order to give you energy, magnesium has to be bound to it. And there has to be two magnesium ions, not just one. These two structures exist in the literature for four decades right now. Nobody knows which one of them is the right one. And you might look at that and say, it's like, what's really the difference? Like, they look so similar. Is that so important? It is important, trust me. If you are working on a drug design, having a structure like that or a structure like that can save you $2 billion. Roughly, a cost of producing new radiopharmaceutical or pharmaceutical can be anywhere from 400 million to $2 billion just to discover it, push it through the FDA approval, and so on. So it will make a difference, not only for researchers, but for further applications. And we were actually the first one. So Triumph, down the road, was the first one to answer this question. It's a little bit complicated <coughs> spectrum. I don't want to go too much into details. But basically, this is the curve that we have measured in our experiment in 20 minutes. And we were able to deconvolute it to three different peaks. The first one is just the solvent we're using, so it's not important. The two important ones are sitting over here. Two isotopes of magnesium and one of them. This is the structure that is active. This is the structure which is not active. And when we dove a bit deeper into that, so we had to do some additional experiments as well, right? Like the concentration studies and temperature studies and so on. We were able to figure out that this is the correct structure. This one, this one is not correct. ATP will never exist in a form like that. And funnily enough, DFT calculations are low for it because it's a certain energetic uh, minimum which is achieved. So from their point of view, this is equally possible as this one. It's not, nature chose this one. And reason for it is, it's kind of intuitive when you look into that. Here magnesium is bridging these two oxygen donors here, right? Here it's just attached to that one. Where the energy is stored in ATP, it's not the whole unit over here. It's stored in this binding and in this binding over here. So it's being released if this binding is cleavaged or this binding is cleavaged. So it's naturally easier and energetically favorable to have it here. Because the body doesn't have to fight against cutting two of them. It cuts just one of them. But now we have the experimental proof of it. This is typical chemical experiment. This is the kind of spectrum you get. Not like that, but like that. And every single one of them took us about three days to measure. And that's what we get. Impossible to, to deduce anything from that. I hinted on that we also can do a temperature studies. So now look at that spectrum and tell me what's wrong there. Because whenever I look at it, it bothers me a big time. And I designed the experiment. And I'm just like so angry with myself that I didn't figure that out earlier. We are talking about human body. What's the temperature of the human body? Do we have a measurement there? We also make mistakes, you know? Um, yeah. The most important thing here, it's missing. But actually, it's not all that useless. We learn a lot from it. You see that the spectra look differently at different temperatures. So ATP will behave very differently when we have infection as opposed to when we don't. And this is also very useful information for us to know. Uh, let me just quickly, for one slide, bring your attention to actinium. Actinium, actinium is becoming extremely popular for targeted uh, cancer treatment. It is extremely powerful. It releases four alpha particles behind. So if we deliver a drug 
to a tumor and let it be there, when actinium decays, it will kill everything within a very short range, but it will just kill it because of the energy. This is fantastic because we are preserving the healthy tissues. So we are not impacting the life of the patient as much as we do with the conventional radiotherapy at the moment. But actinium is extremely rare and difficult to produce. So every single amount of actinium that is being produced worldwide right now is actually being used directly for clinical trials or animal trials. And sadly enough, we know nothing about actinium, about its chemistry. So do you want to know how we produce drugs right now with actinium? We take a radio pharmaceutical, which worked for a given element, and we replace whatever element was used with actinium. And this is our starting point. And then we do study, so serum study, like in our body. If it doesn't work, we have to figure out something else. How do we know in which direction we should move? Which other drug we should use? Well, we don't. We are doing, we are basically guessing. So if we were able to help chemists to figure out which is the way better drug for actinium to capture it and to function and do its job, that would speed up the process of development of radiopharmaceutical and, of course, bring the cost down. On the technical side, just a few slides. I wanted to show you how we actually do it because everything at Triumph, all the experimental setups are under vacuum. So think of that as being in space. And our body is water. So when I'm sending my sample to my experiment, it is pretty much the same as sending an astronaut for a spacewalk without the spacesuit. Not cool. Obviously, there, there is damage to the sample and so on. So we have to find a way to protect it. And how we do it? We do it in several different ways. We are covering our samples with windows. But I wanted to show you a really cool thing and why chemistry is so incredibly, it's, it's so much fun and so cool. We are using graphene. Graphene is just, just monolayer of uh, carbon atoms. They are being interconnected. It comes to you, to the lab, on the baking like that, which is about centimeter by centimeter. It's a copper foil, and graphene is on top of it. Because it's so tiny and it's so thin, you can't see it. But you have to transport it somehow, right, on top of your sample. So what we are doing is we're using camphor. Camphor is like a baking powder. It's white. You spread it on top of your sample, you bake it to 170 degrees, and when you take it out of the oven, it looks like that. There's the structure of tiny crystals around it. Think of them as scaffolding. So our camphor built scaffolding around graphene, and it did it so well and so strong that we can actually use that scaffolding to move our sample wherever we want to. And that's not even the coolest part. The coolest part is that you leave it in the lab for a day, and when you come back the very next day, the whole thing will be gone it will just sublimate. You have no contamination on top of your sample. I was like, I'm always so amazed when I go to the lab and do things like that. It's, it's, it's like doing magic. My students spend a lot of time actually trying to, to figure out how the process should look like and when to do and what. And because our samples are so tiny, they are working under the microscope. And some parts of the process are extremely fragile. So whenever I'm going into my lab, I see like, please, don't, I will, don't touch it, I will be sad. Don't move it, it's fragile. There's also some sort of bribery going on, which makes me question my supervisory skills here. <laughs> but my favorite one yet is this one, and I'm really trying not to take it personally. It's my lab, but I will give it to them. Are we the only group doing that? Well, we started it, we piloted the whole thing, but now we are having followers. So. Personally, our research group has three spectrometers of that kind right now on three different continents. So we have obviously, well, we not obviously one, we have three right now at Triumph, not just one. We have one in France. We are setting up one at Ansto right now, but there are also groups that uh, they would like to do things that we do. And there's one at CERN, and there's also one in, in Japan. So since 2015, which is only seven years, when nothing has been done at all, we didn't even know how to do it, we grew to a network of several different experiments doing the very same thing we are doing. And projects like that, and any projects really in physics or chemistry are not a project of one person. There's always a whole village of people behind it. It's almost like raising a kid. You need help from so many different fields. And especially for the experiment like ours, you need physicists, you need chemists, you need engineers. You, need to, you have to work with medical doctors to know what they want to do. You need to work with biologists, right, and so on. So they all have contributed tremendously to the progress of that uh, particular experiment. But most of all, 
I would like to say enormous thank you to my students. They are phenomenal. They, they are proactive. They are super creative. They are actually taking creativity to the next level. I, I would have been lost without them. And they don't take a no for an answer, as you can see here. So. And thank you for your attention.